right, everyone. It's time to uh, leave the stage or give the stage to Frederick and Fabian from Node One, uh, who's going to talk about pregnant hippos and why the Drupal site is as slow as one. Right? Thank you. First off, uh, I would like to thanks. Thank you guys for inviting us to talk here to this awesome Drupal Glen Camp event. Uh, it's also nice to see so many of you here. Apparently, Drupal performance is sucks <laughs> since you all is here listening how to make it better. Uh, as I said, my name is Fredrik Bergström, alias Bobo Drone, and um, I work at Node One. Yeah. Uh, before we start, we need to clarify some things. Um, so, uh, we're saying here that, that uh, your group of size are slow as pregnant hippos. It, it turns out hippos are very fast. <laughs> uh, they can actually run up to 50 kilometers an hour. Uh, so, we, we changed the title. Uh, so, hopefully, they are not as fast when they are eight months pregnant. Who knows? So, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we can actually go there. So I'm Fabian uh, Fausor, um, and this is Freddy Bobberdrome. You can catch us on Twitter on Drupal.org if you like to. So, all right. So, in this presentation, we will talk about four different things. Uh, we're going to talk about the difference between shared hosting and VPS. Uh, we're going to talk about profiling, uh, performance oriented site building, and caching. Uh, I'm going to start off by talking about the hosting uh, thing. Um, there are a number of different options today. Um, in the beginning, there were only one. If you have your own server, you can actually present some cool stuff on the web. And then the web hotels came up, and now there are like thousands of them. Um, I'm going to talk about very briefly basic difference between those two so you understand what you need uh, to, to, what kind of tools you might, I mean, we're going to talk about some tools later on that you, is may, may be suitable for one of them and not the other one. Uh, so I'm going to just do this very crash course. Uh, this is, might be quite too basic for you, but still. Uh, standard traditional web hotel shares the same physical server with others. It shares the same software, uh, the web server software, um, the databases, and also the, often they use the same versions uh, of the software. Uh, it's often pre-configured for generic use, so it can be quite tricky to play with it if you want to enhance your performance. Um, it could also mean that you're, you're sharing the same load of the server. Um, I saw that there were some guys from Odeland up here. Are they in the hall? Is there anyone from Odeland here? No, they're up there, I think. Um, I'm going to tell you a short story. I created a website um, a number of years ago, which uh, was hosted on Odeland. And um, I, 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 I fetched some XML feed, like f 10 megabytes. And I was supposed to do it on cron, like once, once a day in the midnight. Uh, and I did some parsing, and I saved very tiny information of data of, of the big source and show it, showed it to the, on the client's website. Um, apparently, I did something wrong when I set up the cron. So I run this every minute instead of every day, uh, which means I completely crashed the server for other hosts, and my account was cancelled. Uh, so I had to call them up and explain that, oh, sorry, I'm stupid. Um, so it, it can mean that you're actually affecting other people's load as well. And the pros, of course, the price is very easy. I mean, it's, it's uh, very inexpensive. You can get a web hotel today for like 10 kroner a month. Uh, it's easy to set up, often very good support. Um, you have automatic backups, most of the cases, and it's very stable. You can actually sleep well at night. You don't have to take care of your own shit. Um, the cons is, of course, it's quite limited in options when it comes to configuring the software on the server. Uh, you have a limited use of disk space and memory, and sometimes, for one example, is that it can be limited how many, how big files you can transfer up to the server. Like if you want to post a um, node with um, um, big images or sound files or stuff that you want to have on your host. It can be quite tricky. 
you can't install additional software. Uh, that's a very bad thing. And this is generic. I mean, there are was, there was other web hotels that actually support this. Often you only have FTP access for file transferring. There's also uh, some web hotels is actually have solved that. Uh, you have no compression tool, file manager, no SSH access. And it's a fixed price per account, so it can be quite tricky to upgrade if you want to have more space or more memory. Um, the VPS, the uh, virtual private server, well, it's the same thing. You're actually sharing the same, many, or most of the cases, you're sharing the same hardware, but it's partitioned in a way so it acts like its own server. Um, and it's often. When you get it, like if you get a Linux distribution, it's like empty. You don't get anything. You have to configure and install the software yourself, most of the cases. And it's, uh, it's a hard work, but once you've done that, you can actually install other software and configure it the way you like it. And in most cases, when it comes to Drupal 7, you really would like to do that. Um, you can install additional software, of course, like caching software, profiling, debugging, or other development tools. Um, the pros here is that it's quite ex inexpensive too. It can be. You can get a like a very simple um, mini server for like less than 200 crowns per month. Uh, you have flexible cost, which means that you can scale it up. If you want to have more memory, you can just scale it up for a couple of hours or one day or whatever, most of the cases, and then you can take it down again. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone is supporting this, but I know that Glacius does at least. Most. Most, I think, do this. Uh, of course, that you can install the software you might need to enhance your Drupal 7 performance. You can do this on a, your own server. Uh, and, of course, you have co complete control over the web configuration. The bad thing is it's quite hard to set up for a newbie. As, as I said, this is a like, crash course in the difference. If, you're, if you never set up a Linux server before, it takes a few minutes to do it. Uh, in the end, it might start into a bit more expensive solution, especially if you have a blog with 10,000 simultaneous users. You're not going to be able to run that on that mini setup. You're going to have to add more processors and memory and stuff. Uh, there is no really support because you're doing the work yourself. If you're hosting a website on one.com, and the site goes down, you might call them and say, what's hell, what the hell is going on? In this case, you have to have two mobile phones and call yourself and say, hey, what's going on? Oh, there's some problem here. Um, there is no automatic backup by default, but you can actually buy that kind of services as an extra at some of these providers. Um, one thing to notice, though, that about this sharing the same load is that if you're having a lot of simultaneous users and you don't have some kind of caching and you're, they're all logged in, you might crash the server, your own server, because you're going to reach the roof of the memory. So you will have to buy more memory or the server will go very slow or crash. So which one should I choose then? Um, of course, this is very generic talk, but if you have a very low memory demanding site, like almost no image handling and stuff, uh, there's no, especially there's no need for version control uh, or other terminal-based software that you have to have on a server. Um, you want to save money, have easy setup, sleep well at night. Of course, you can do share hosting. Um, in all other cases, you should actually try to use the VPS uh, or any other cloud, cloud server solution. Um, there's an exception. I talked about them earlier. Now it sounds like that I'm working for Ruby Land here. I'm not. Uh, but I would say I have, in the past, uh, when I was working as a freelancer, I had a lot of customers, and they are still hosted on Ruby Land. And they, they really rock, because you, you get all this for a very little amount of money. You get SSH access. You get Git installed. I just installed Rush the other day on the server. Um, this is not a VPS, this is a shared hosting account. They also have VPS accounts or dedicated servers. But this is a cheap like, um, shared hosting account. And you've got a great web-based file manager. You can instill some additional software through their cPanel interface. You can tweak your PHP configuration. Um, and they have really good support. So enough with the sales talk. But it is a great company. There are others, I know that. Um, there is a list. 
of the Swedish uh, Drupal group, which uh, lists some tested web hotels. And if you have other experience of bad and good experience, you should add to that list. Um, there is a generic Drupal.org slash hosting page which shows mostly North American <laughs> web hosting stuff. Um, but still, there's some good choices there as well. And just uh, just mention this, uh, if you still want to keep on doing shared hosting, you should look at this module called Boost because it's really cool. Because from now on, we're going to talk about stuff that we you're going to need a VPS to to to, to work on. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about Drupal. Um, and yeah, as you probably know, uh, Drupal can be quite a memory and CPU hog, like this piece here, uh, and it's basically it's because of. Uh, well, it's because of a, a lot of things we're going to go through later on. But in order to actually start being able to uh, being able to well, performance test your site, you need some tools to go through. Uh, so you need to be able to measure the difference between uh, between well, in configuration A and configuration B. So in order to actually start out, we're going to go through some of the solutions that you can use to to. Well, see if you have a difference between different solutions. Uh, so we're going to talk about some generic benchmark tools for benchmarking, well, uh, HTTP performance from, from servers, like Apache. Uh, some tools in Drupal to help you out. Um, and a little bit about code profiling and also some browser tools that you can use for front-end performance. Uh, mostly our focus is going to be on, on back-end uh, though, so we're not going to do that much front-end performance uh, today. Yeah, so now we're soon going to switch over to the terminal and uh, Slim here, I'm Hippo and he's Slim, uh, he's going to uh, be my terminal bitch. Uh, so. I'm going to talk a little bit about Apache Bench. It's a benchmarking tool which um, uh, you can run tests on your server to send requests to it and measure how the server is working on a specific page. Um, and um, you, this um, is included in the Apache uh, server. So just open up your terminal and type AB which is Apache Bench, uh, you type the flag dash n for um, setting how many requests you want to send and then the URL. And you can also set if you want to have like um, concurrent users, for example. So right now we're going to look at a site um, and see if we can get some different numbers. Yeah, so uh, we have to set up two websites right now. Uh, we have pipo.nobana.se that contains some modules. Then we have Slim here, which is actually a, a standard, uh, uh, well, not standard, even minimal installation profile uh, that, can, that can be coming with Drupal, and it doesn't have anything. And Hippo has several things like views, media, panels uh, on it. So I'm going to just run a very quick and simple benchmark just to show you how it works um, on Hippo and then on Slim so you can see some of the differences there. Uh, so I'm going to do... So I'm going to work, just send out a really easy request. So AB, which is Apache Bench, you get information there and you can also get even more information with the man, AV command, which is the more exhaustive version. Uh, you can do several things with, uh, but uh, I'm just going to do a very simple thing here. So I'm going to do AV dash N, which means number of requests. Uh, I'm going to do 10 for now, and then just the URL. So. So here we are starting the benchmark, we're sending 10 requests here against Hippo. And as you can see here, we get a several um, results back. Um, so we have uh, one, some of the important ones are number of requests per second, obviously. We were able to serve out four. Um, uh, the, the average time per request. Um, and 
which is well the average of all the requests. And down here, in the in the bottom. Do you see it? Uh, yeah. Should I should I increase? There we are. Yeah. This is better, right? Yeah. yeah. So down here, you see the percentage of the requests served within a certain time. So here we, we're basically saying that 50% of the requests were served within 226 milliseconds uh, per request. And the absolute longest requests were at 310 milliseconds. Uh, another parameter you can, you can put on, which, which is pretty useful, is, is C, which is concurrency. So if you put C here and I say 10, we will actually spawn up 10 different threads and do 10 simultaneous requests against this web server, which, uh, which gives us different results. Notice here that we have 12, that we could do 12 requests per second. However, uh, if you look at the time per request, we have 246 milliseconds per request up here. And we're actually having 799 requests uh, for, the, for the request time when we did more, when we had more um, concurrent requests. So, this, so just to show, I can show you as well that if you look at the performance here, it is HTOP, which is a pretty awesome tool if you want to look at this current server performance. It runs in the terminal and uh, it shows some really good statistic of your current situation. And if you increase the number of, uh, uh, of requests we're going to do, we can see here while we're, we're doing it that... Uh, it's hitting the roof. Is, well, we're hitting the roof basically with Apache requests. Uh, notice here that we have this cool thing called node average uh, in, in this corner here. Uh, and four, uh, and now we have a load average of 4.7.27. So, uh, and you should think about load average as it's basically the number of CPUs that you have. If your if your num load average is over uh, four in this case that I have on this computer, then you might be in a little bit of trouble because you will not be able to serve out uh, um, as many requests as you want here. Um, so you can you can experiment here and see where you hit the roof uh, just by changing these uh, arguments uh, and see uh, and based on how uh, on, on the estimated traffic. Say I need to be able to serve say ten concurrent users, uh, which do does something all the time. And note here that this is all the time when we do this kind of request. Then I could set uh, the configuration here and see the response time and see if it's acceptable. Uh, yes, as a reference point, uh, if we go against Hippo here, uh, we got 463, and if we go as, against Slim instead, uh, we should get uh, well 661. So that's and that's a quite big improvement if you compare them, uh, which we can we'll talk about a bit later. So that's Apache Bench. It's a very very easy tool to work with. Um, it's useful if you really need, uh, if you need to do something really quick uh, and, and and try it out. and very easy to, to work with. However, if you need to go deeper and do more complex things, I suggest that you have a look at JMeter. I'm not going to show it because it's a very complex tool to set up, and you're probably going to have to read a few tutorials. But it will basically do the laundry for you if you if you just configure it correctly, and you can do things like setting up. As test suite, where you where you go like log in, create an article, go back and do like an, an estimated uh, well, what a, you could estimate what, what a regular user would do, and you can try that with different concurrencies and get graphs and, and nice things to show to to your clients as well. So if you really want to go a little bit deeper than AD, which you in some cases want to, do, I really suggest you have a look at JMeter. Um, so now we're going to focus on the Drupal tools that are available. Um, we have the Devel module. Uh, maybe everyone here knows about it, so this is basic stuff. But still, um, Devel uh, module lets you um, 
First of all, it lets you print out the query log, so you can see all the queries that is run that is run to the database, which can be really, really cool uh, when you're looking for trouble. If you have views that we're going to show you later, if you have views that are really demanding, a lot of fields and joins, you can actually see that in this query log. Uh, the Vel also have a page timer, so you can see how much time the whole page took to render. It also shows a memory footprint. It shows how much memory, PHP memory, it uses for every page. And it also um, helps supporting creating XHPROF export files uh, that we're going to look into later. So, so sorry, wrong one. <laughs> um, so, uh, if you, after you install the VEL, uh, you get to this page here where you can enable several things. Uh, XHProf, which we will get into a little bit later, and, uh, but more importantly, the query log, which I can select to display here. So I can actually uh, go and, and, and see, I will see a visual query log of my current situation. Down here, I also have some handy tools like a page timer, memory usage, and also some other things that are not related to performance but could be useful anyway, like seeing the current page array. Usually you don't want to see that at all, but <laughs> yeah. All right, so I enable that, and if I go down now to the bottom of my page, I get uh, a query log showing me all the queries that are that have been done on this page. So. Uh, we can see here that um, we currently don't have anything standing out, really. This is the front page of Drupal, so it's, well, it should be weird if we found something that's very strange. But we can, for instance, notice that we have a lot of Drupal database cache queries that just does query, uh, well, fetching cache, uh, which is most of the requests here, actually. Um, and we can also see here Scroll up. Can you scroll up a little bit? And the other way. All right. Uh, you can see here that you, we executed 54 queries, uh, and the total amount of time was 18 milliseconds in this case. Uh, and, we, and as you can see here, we can see the amount of memory before boot, uh, develop, well, at develop boot, and the develop boot is run very, very early in, in the process. It's running when boot boot is running, which is in the very, very beginning of the request. And then the amount of memory that we have uh, at, the, at the, well, the end of the request here. Uh, so you can see things are happening here. Uh, all right, so. You can also see the page execution time up there, 280 milliseconds. So that's pretty useful if you guys want to see some, some of the which queries are run, what seems to be a problem, with, with, is it a database problem, does it seem that we are doing more in, in code, or, or do we have some really heavy queries? So we're going to continue talking about profiling. Uh, we're going to show you two different tools, not in depth, but we're going to show how to use them a little bit. The first one is called HXProf, and it's developed by Facebook, if I'm not mistaken. It's a profiling ex extension for PHP. Uh, it has its own browser UI for reading the profiling data. It all, there is also a Drupal module called XHProf, which is doing the same thing. Uh, don't try to use them at the same time because they will try to read the same class files and it will break your site. We're going to show you the, um, uh, the browser UI, the software that is shipped with this extension. Um, this can actually be used um, while in production uh, on your production server. But don't have it on all the time. No, <laughs> just use it when you need it. Um, so, uh, SHProf is a PHP extension, so um, you have to, well, compile it or use a pre-made package for it in your favorite distribution. Uh, admittedly, it's pretty hard to set up, yeah. but uh, we manage. <laughs> Uh, if you need some help setting that up, you can grab us later on and we can try and help you uh, if you if you want to. So I'm just going to enable the extension now. Um, uh, so here we go. Uh, and restart my server. Um, 
as you saw before in the develop uh, uh, settings, there were some related things related to XHProf here. So this is just if you want to enable profiling. Uh, this uh, is dependent on your configuration when you compile XHProf, but this is where uh, the, the actual profiling data is and, and the UI for it. Uh, uh, and this is where you can get to it from, from the web. Uh, so uh, once all that is set up, um, you can go down on any on any of the requests. You I have. think it's above that. Oh yeah, you have a little link. Where is it? There. Yeah. Uh, that is that gives you a link to an H XH prof output. So this um, page shows you a number of things, a lot of numbers. First of all, X XHProf is doing the calculations for each function that is called on this page. And it shows how many calls the, each function is made, the time it took, the CPU time, the memory it has been eating up and so on. If you go to the top a little bit, please, you can see the overall. This took 262 um, <laughs> thousand microseconds. <laughs> it's a strange format. It's, that is like 0 0.2 seconds or 262 milliseconds. Um, the memory was used was 28 megabytes. This is in bytes. Uh, the number of function calls is 24,480. That's a lot actually, but it can be more. We're going to show that later. So if you go down, here you have the function name of all the function. The main function is the first function in Drupal. So that one stands for 100% of all the time. The wall time is like a timeline, or you can see it as it's the time this function has spent, including all the sub-functions that, that has been called. There is an excluded wall time, is, which is how, man, how much time this function has used without any of the sub or ch children functions used. So you can see that the main function is really, really little. It's, all the work is done by the rest of the functions. Uh, from the beginning it just lists the first hundred, but you can actually show the, all of them. But, so, uh, in this case we have um, sorted on... What did you sort on? Calls? No? No, exclusive wall time. Yeah, exclusive wall time. <laughs> so you can see that the PDO statement is the function that is called uh, considered to be the, the most heavy. Uh, it, it, it has been called 54 times, which stands for 0.2% of all the calls. If you go to the memory-wise column, we can look. Uh, you can see that it uses 0 0.4. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's okay. That's okay. Um, in this case, we are sorted by the memory use instead. So this is a function that it's 28, almost 29 megabytes. Uh, I wanna, really want to see what kind of function that is. Can we go back? Which one was it? That's main. Uh, That's main, okay. Exclusive, uh, inclusive, I mean. Okay, you should, you should use ex always use exclusive if you want to see how much that was using. Yeah, uh, exclusive here is did go back trace interesting enough, but it's because we're using the value. Yeah. So the, the idea here is that if you click one of these functions, um, you will see all the function that is calling this function. You will also see all the functions that are ch children or child, child functions within this one. So here you can see the unserialize. Uh, it's a um, uh, PHP core function, so it can't really have any children. But you can see which parent is calling this one. And you can see the distribution of the number of calls, for example. This should sum up to 91. Uh, in some cases, the numbers are like 101 percentage or something. So it's <laughs> something is happening with the calculations. But it will actually give you a figure of where to start looking. So this is a very cool tool if you want to uh, see if you have created your own function that's really suck. You can see it here right away. The last thing I want to show you is the call graph. Um, with, this, with this UI, <laughs> it actually creates um, an image of all the functions getting called with all their relations. It also tries to get the most like 
dangerous or heavy function and map the route all the way to that function to the bottom. So you can see here, if you follow the big lines, you can see uh, this is an analysis that they think is the, the worst way, <laughs> the worst function in this way. So if you go down, let's continue. Let's see which one is the red one. The red one is the most dangerous one. This is scary. We're getting there, I hope. Oh, there it is. Oh, look, there's a database connection. Of course. But you can see here, it's a red box that says this is critical, which is kind of interesting because it's not critical, really. It's the most critical function called in this, in this page. But it's actually standing for 21 milliseconds, which is not that much. Yeah. So, uh, another alternative to this is using xdebug, which is more or less, um, uh, it's, it's mostly a debugger, uh, which is highly recommended for your development work, but it can also do profiling. Uh, due to that we don't have that much time left, I'm going to skip this one. Uh, but uh, what it basically does, it outputs uh, a file that is in the in cache grind format, which is the standard format for looking into performance. Uh, uh, in different languages as well. Um, it, and uh, you can use tools like kcashgrind to, to, to get a good visualized uh, view of it uh, uh, as well. And in some cases it's more, it's easier to go, well, traverse through the tree of function if there are a lot of them when using xdebug. But, you never use this in production. It's, it's horrible. Um, <laughs> So, we also have some browser tools, but I feel that we need to... Yeah, we need to go on with the hardcore stuff. Um. And also this. Uh, so, <laughs> performance site building is mostly about one thing, actually. And that's reducing the complexity. And that means you should use as few modules as possible. You should try to do as few requests as possible. Use as few views as possible, use as few paths as possible, and also you always use CSS and JavaScript aggregation. If you, so, now you can go home. <laughs> Unless you want to hear about the caching, do you want that? <laughs> no. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to skip the field this one. But yeah. uh, in reality, of, of course, we need to have some views and some uh, panels, but you really, really need to think about what you're doing there. I'm going to show you an example of views and how, how different performance, how it impacts performance. And first off, I'm going to just show you where you're going to put in some settings to actually get uh, a good view of what's going on. Um, uh, so, uh, it, views has some pretty neat settings which were what was, which was always present before, but they thought it was a good idea to remove it in views three because they, well, they thought the normal users would actually be able to use it. I don't know why they ever thought that, but here we go. So under admin structure view settings, you have some settings that you can, that you can select here, and the most important ones are here in the live preview section. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, you should be able to show information and statistics about your views. Uh, you should show the SQL query so you see what you're actually working with, and the performance statistics, which I will show you here and now. So, uh, if we take a view, does everyone see? Uh, is it, you see the screen? Can you see what's going on? Yeah. All right, good. Uh, so, we have this test view here. Uh, right now we have some uh, title, we have some fields, uh, and um, it's a very, very simple view. It just lists everything, 20 items. So let's have a look at the view. Um, uh, as you can see here, the query is not, nothing special, really. Um, it fetches some stuff, uh, and it has a, a limit of 20 and so on. So we, we are down at, at an execution time of 23 milliseconds. Uh, for the query execution. You can also, no, also no, note though that the render time of this is 67. So we have, 30, we have several second milliseconds uh, working through the rendering, which takes more time than actually doing the execution in this case. Uh, so 
uh, this is a lot due to that we have some fields here. Uh, I'm just going to show you what happens when we start removing some of them. Uh, we got down to 55, and we remove one other field, and we're down to 44, and yet another one. Uh, now we're down to 30. So, uh, as you can see, uh, working with uh, with um, fields is actually pretty uh, costly. Uh, not that much, but pretty costly. However, the most interesting things happen when you start fiddling around with your filters. Uh, notice the query right now. We have no joins, which is a good thing, uh, because I join, well, it's a lot of work to shoot for, for my SQL. Uh, so I'm going to add uh, a filter criteria based on a field. Uh, and I'm going to do like body here. And right now I have no idea whatever, so I'm just going to say that it should be empty. Radio. Uh, if I update the preview right now, look at the query here. We got a left join. Um, to against field data body. Each field in the Drupal database has its own table, which means that in order to be able to filter on it, we actually have to do a left join, and since we don't really know, uh, well, there is no option for use to actually inner join instead, we're joining here with, with left join, which means that we have to fetch everything from both tables and then match it together, basically. Uh, so, uh, Doing filters can do some pretty interesting things, and, and actually a pretty radical query execution time uh, here, uh, if you compare it to when I removed it. We have 280 now, and we remove, and we're down to 9.86 in execution time. So that's a pretty radical difference. So you should always only use one field and no filters. <laughs> That's the conclusion. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Don't use filters. No. Uh, what I'm saying here is that, uh, that actually you have to be aware of this. And uh, we're going to show you some techniques to actually be able to use this in, in the same way, even if you have a lot of things to do. I'm just going to show you another thing. Uh, there are relationships which are handy dandy. Um, and yeah, I can, for instance, I, in this case, I have some, I thought I had some related options. This is on the hippo, is that right? It's his own, yeah. Yeah, there it is. So uh, I'm just going to fetch, uh, do a relationship here. Notice this checkbox, and always check it if it's actually true. Because look here, uh, when I do this query now, I have two left joints, one on the actual field, and then another left joint to get the data. Uh, this is not good. Uh, we've got to also, well, the execute time, we're actually that bad right now, but... Um, anyway, uh, if I do require this relationship instead, we, we got an inner join, and inner joins are good compared to left joins. So always think about this when you do a lot of relationships, that if you actually require this, to, uh, then make sure that checkbox is checked. Uh, so, another thing about views is that obviously this can go pretty, pretty, pretty heavy, pretty fast, is that there is actually caching settings on a particular view, and use it and use it wisely. Uh, what, what we have here is that we can actually use time-based cache, uh, and we can select that, well, this is, this is the latest article, so it doesn't matter if they're 30 minutes old, really. Who will care? Well, um, someone might, uh, but uh, we don't, so let's put some caching on that query. And we can actually skip doing, uh, doing the query at all. Now it doesn't do that in, in, uh, when I do it like in, uh, in the UI here, but when I actually show this, it will cache it. Uh, instead of using, uh, instead of doing the query all over again. And this is essential if you have, say, four or five or even ten views on a page. Just don't. Um, and just make sure that you cache the ones that are not actually have to have 
relevant content all the time. Also, when profiling, uh, don't be fooled by Monty, the creator of MySQL, because he has a very nice feature called query cache size, which is pretty awesome. Then what he does is he's caching all the queries for you. So it's um, so uh, well, you will not see the results when you're working. Uh, because while you're working, you will see that, oh, it's all handy dandy, it's just five milliseconds or something. First time it was 200, and now it's five, so I guess it's fine. But it's not, because if you are using, uh, when you evaluate the cache, for instance, on the Drupal level, maybe you, uh, then your cache, the query cache will be warmed up, so you will have, you will actually hit the, uh, the database with like uh, a lot of maybe 200 millisecond queries. Uh, so watch out for fields, watch your join, uh, look at different styles, and also avoid having things like views field view, doing views attach, and, and things like that. Because that will actually execute one view inside of a view, which is usually not a very good idea. Um, also, as you saw, the, we have a lot of fields, uh, and they have, water on, they have their own table. Uh, and the default backend is pretty slow because we have different tables. You can actually use other backends like MongoDB, uh, and, uh, but you will not be able to use it with default views then. You have to use EFQ views. Uh, we have about 10, 15 slides away. We realize that our time is, is over. Yeah. Uh, we were really going to show you the cool stuff about caching. The good part is that uh, we probably will have a session next time only about caching then, if you allow us. Um, I'm going to show one last thing, uh, which is basically uh, varnish. Uh, Drupal has some pretty neat things out of the box for caching, like cache pages for anonymous users, and then say that we have an expiration of 15 minutes here, and also aggregate some CSS files. Uh, if you actually go and log out now and use something like Varnish, uh, uh, let's see, uh, I can get a pretty neat result from that. Uh, notice here, this is the one that we're going for right now, and the time I don't even see it. Uh, let's do a little performance test on that as well. Um, uh, hippo. Uh, let's see test. Hippo. So we're benchmarking on. Oh, no, that won't actually do. 60. There we go. Thousand oh. requests. <laughs> so if it's something you're going to look into if you have anonymous users, it's varnish. And we'll do it again because it's so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and also, if you, if you get yourself a VPS server, start by installing APC cache, opcode cache, and varnish. That's going to help you survive for non-logged-in users. All right, I guess that's it. Yeah.